Hello, everyone. Just a quick announcement before this week's episode. As you know, the holidays are coming up. That means people will be shopping. So if you're looking for the perfect gift for yourself, the aviation enthusiast, or maybe you have a military enthusiast you'll be shopping for, well, we recommend you head over to fighterpilotpodcast.com and click on our shop page where you will find various links to clothing and apparel through Cafe Press or home decor through Society6. I mean, who doesn't want a giant shower curtain with an F-35 coming right at you, right? Or some throw pillows with an AH-1 attack helicopter coming at you? What could be better? And also we have books as well as wine with our friend Bull from Volatus. It's all there on our shop page. And also, if you're not already supporting a charity or some other organization through your Amazon shopping, would you please consider clicking on our shop Amazon link before you make your purchases? It costs you nothing more, but it provides us a little affiliate income that helps keep your favorite internet radio show going. So if you would consider the Fighter Pilot Podcast this holiday season, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, on to the show. This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You might have several groups out there, and there may be some of them that may be more tactically interesting or tactically important than others. And that's where you as the fighter lead, and then me as the air intercept control, or we're going to work together to decide what is most important and where your attention needs to be focused. Sometimes that's going to be really obvious to you. Sometimes it takes a guy that's sitting and looking at a little bit more impartial view of the world to realize what's going to be the most important thing the soonest. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. And now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Jello! Sunshine! What's up, hey, man? Oh, no, hold on. So, anyway, Wait, hey, no. I heard you just got qualled and all that stuff. I mean, that's amazing. Welcome back. You know what's a, what? What? Awesome. Wait, I'll go. Dude. You, you go first. But, I'll go uh, first. So, oh, okay. You have the lead. Lead left. Okay. Well, Excellent. So, oh. this is why, on this episode, we're going to talk about communication Calm, brevity and who has the cadence and the priority excellent very well done how you doing buddy doing well <laughs> man well let me first start off with welcome back fully qual thank you very much yes a month in atlanta yeah how was uh, atlanta this time of uh, year actually it was very very pleasant a little okay. bit of rain but it was nice i walked from the hotel to the training center no problem there and and it was quite nice actually did you get to be a tourist at all or were you in the classroom the entire time pretty much the classroom i did come home midway through to see the family for less than 48 hours and then the third weekend i was there i took a break and went fishing bravo fishing to where <laughs> on the chattahoochee way of down Alan jackson fame yeah it yeah. was good yeah i, I caught it. a couple brown trout and i caught a 193 pound human being when I Ouch. stuck a hook into my arm, first Ouch. time doing oh, that. Oh, in the arm? Fun. Not the finger, the arm? Arm, yes, in the arm. So Ugh. I had to pull it out, and it, it was fun. But anyway, yeah, no big deal. What about you? How was Alaska? Chilly and dark. <laughs> so I uh, went up there. The uh, One day, the high was 17 degrees, as in Fahrenheit, 17 degrees. Wow. And then the subsequent days, though, because it's all relative, it got up to 25. And I actually felt, wow, I don't need a jacket. Because it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit out. It's all relative. It is all relative. Excellent. So. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am Jello. I am Sunshine. And we are your hosts. And today, as you figured out from our little blabbery intro there, we are talking air intercept communications, air-to-air communications. I'm not sure what we're going to call this yet, but it's the comms that happen during an air-to-air intercept. Absolutely. And so I did this recording with Niles the other day. You had a chance to listen to it. Yeah, Niles is a great American. He and I cruised back when uh, we were both DHs or department heads, so okay. kind of middle management in the squadron. The guys in the middle, right? So they Absolutely. have to answer the guys above and the guys below, et cetera. All right, that sounds good. Well, anyway, we'll get to that interview in just a second. But before, we've got a couple more announcements. Your first Veterans Day just went by as a veteran and a recent retiree. Thank and you. you started your new job, which is what took you to Alaska. Absolutely. So all that going well, I hope? It is, yeah. It's a good group of guys there at, at the, uh, the new job, if you will. So enjoyed it indeed. Okay, good. And as everyone knows, I finished up some training. I'll be starting a new airport 
airplane actually tomorrow with my first trip on the 757 and 767. So that's all good. And let's see what else. We had a new musings post that I put up. Uh, I don't know if you've been following that, Sunshine. But Absolutely. Good we, read. Great yeah, pictures. Thanks. Great pictures, Oh, thank too. you. Well, we need Absolutely. to get you on there at some point if you have any some former emails or anything you want to wax poetic about. But in, in this case, <laughs> I've been telling stories from emails that I sent on our 2003 deployment when Very everything nice. was hot and heavy with Iraq right after we invaded their based on some weapons of mass destruction, the war on terror, all that. So anyway, people can check that out on our website. And I think that's pretty much it. Now, we have a relatively long interview, but I thought it would be okay to maybe do a listener question or two. What do you think? Absolutely. But hey, I got to give a shout out to the guys that have been answering up on our Facebook page all the technical trivia questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, not only do they get the answers right, obviously, they pretty much nail it every time, but also... Besides the academic answers, they're injecting kind of their own personal history, if you will. So, I mean, like Daniel talks about, hey, I love the F-104 Starfighter. And then we had Darren, who mentioned that his old boss did some DACT, which we'll probably get to dissimilar air combat training. That's right. right. Did some DACT with 104s. He talked about how the thing turns kind of like a dog on linoleum. So, in other words, it's got a very <laughs> large turn radius. Sure. And anyway, so just, uh, guys, keep the good answers coming. And also, keep the stories coming, though. That kind of adds depth to those Facebook trivia challenges. Well, and it's just fun to engage with people too. You know, there's so many folks out there that enjoy being a part of this community, talking about this subject and sharing what they know. So it's a good way to engage with them. I'm glad you're doing that because you have a different outlook on some of this stuff with your experience, both as a student, but also instructing this stuff at the academy like you did. So, all right. So for listener questions, Nick Matviev, he is one of our Patreon guys who gets head of the line privileges. So we'll give him one of his questions again. He says, Sunshine, what was your favorite type of mission to fly and why? Mine was probably going to be from the test era of my flying, and Ooh. I actually chased the Tomahawk cruise missile. Oh, you did talk about that once here on the show. Did I? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, I guess I'll revisit it. Okay. Then. So, what made it your favorite? Uh, probably watching the impact of the Tomahawk on a moving barge. So, if you go to YouTube, you can see this video, but they had a uh, trying to think through what I can and cannot say here. But basically, there's a moving <laughs> barge which a Tomahawk up until this point in the test mm-hmm. had never consummated intercept with a moving target. Sure, always fixed stationary targets. It is, absolutely. Okay. And, I, and I believe that the uh, the information is loaded into the weapon ahead of time. But now they can actually update the weapon real time. And so with that, it was a monumental step in our, our national doctrine, if you will. We now okay. have Tomahawk cruise missiles that can attack moving targets. All right. And I got to be part of that evaluation. So that was even your very specific most favorite mission. So test missions in general, maybe, and that one particularly. I think for me, Nick, you you know, he listed an example here, like maybe air-to-air or close air support. I would say probably dogfighting if... I can put a caveat here. Mm -hmm. Either it was an airplane that I had a slight advantage over in my (laughs) airplane or a pilot who I had a slight advantage over. Okay, so let's go one step further. Would you rather do some BFM in a Viper or a Hornet? Hornet, only because, you know, so let's transport ourselves back to 2015, right, before I left Fallon when I was about as good as I was going to get in the F-16, which wasn't that great after only 170 hours. But it was a whole different way of fighting because it would not perform angle of attack excursions like the F-18 would. So I had to relearn how to do BFM. I had to think harder about it. Whereas in the F-18, it was just muscle memory from so many repetitions. So I would say an F-18C, probably clean, would be my choice there. And yeah, if you've got an opponent who you have a slight advantage over, that's a little more satisfying. I don't know if that's... I agree. I like to stack the deck. Stack the deck, totally. Um, But otherwise, I would say another one was close air support. I don't know if you felt this way, but I thought it was so technical... And you had to do the timing, you had to arrive on target, you had only a split second to figure out which target was yours, and then you had to deliver your bomb accurately. I found that very, very challenging. I agree. And also, uh, if you think about what we train versus what we execute, Mm -hmm. we did a lot of cast practice, and then in theater, I did a lot of close air support, whereas I didn't get to do any real BFM against a bad guy, right? true. Mm -hmm. But I felt the reward of uh, protecting guys on the ground by delivering ordnance on time, on target... It was just uh, second to none. Uh, Very cool. All right. Jim Hearson from Blighty asks, why does the F-16 Viper have a tinted canopy? This one might be for you, Sunshine. He says it looks kind of gold colored, whereas the other jets like the F-A-18 appear completely transparent. I'm going to say because the Viper guys didn't want to be seen driving that POS. Oh, just kidding. (laughs) 
Now, in reality, it has to do with RF, so radio frequency, or EMF, electromotive force, however you want to think of it. But when it comes to radar returns, without dipping too much into the confidential side, we'll just say that it helps with the RCS, or the radar cross-section. Doesn't the Prowler have, I think, some gold tinted canopy as well they perhaps? do absolutely okay. yeah and if you guys are interested uh look up faraday cage and that'll help you to understand how or how it doesn't uh, transmit rf spell faraday a faraday is in the uh, the french guy f-a-r-r-a-d-a-y oh wow faraday. okay i've heard that word before but i couldn't sit here and tell you what it means so all right excellent well why don't we keep it at that like i said we've got a slightly longer interview why don't we jump now then to our discussion on air intercept communications with commander alan shafino call sign niles and sunshine you and i will pick this back up on the backside sounds like a plan all right, everyone. Today, we have Navy Commander Alan Shafino joining us to talk all about fighter communications. Niles, welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Well, thanks for having me here. It's good to uh, have the chance to do this. Yeah, for sure. We're going to have a good time. And, you know, this is arguably one of those subjects that's maybe not going to get its own movie. Not to say that every topic we do on the show gets its own movie, but I would say it's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is not necessarily the most glamorous part of naval aviation, but it is uh, it is absolutely essential in being able to do what we do. For sure. And until communication gets completely calm out, which we can talk maybe a little bit about at the end, it's always going to be important, just like it is for a marriage, for people to be able to communicate clearly and understand what's going on. So before we jump into that, though, could you give us, please, a quick background on you? Where are you from? Where did you go to college? And tell us about your Navy career so far. Okay. Well, uh, I am the son of a person in the Navy. My dad was in the Navy for 20 years. He was a lithographer, which is a, a person who's a printer, and he ran the dark room and that sort of thing uh, on the ship. He had served on aircraft carriers uh, before and tends to be the larger ships that have those kinds of uh, facilities on board. But uh, after seeing him in the Navy and our lifestyle of moving around uh, around the country and around the world, um, I got to live in Japan when I was younger and uh, he was stationed in Naples, Italy for a while when I was in middle school. So I definitely liked that aspect of not being anchored to one spot in the world. The other part, though, of course, was the, the educational opportunity of joining the Navy. And uh, that's definitely what, uh, what pulled me into it. So I wound up uh, going to Georgia Tech and uh, had a Navy ROTC scholarship there. And then from there, I got to go fly in the Navy, which is absolutely what I wanted to do. Let me, let me interrupt. What did you study at Georgia Tech? Aerospace engineering. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, because we've said on the show before that you don't have to study that <laughs> to, uh, to come in and be an aviator in the Navy. But anyway, it worked for you, clearly. Yes. So, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I had always wanted to fly, and my grandfather had always wanted to fly as well. So, he wanted to kind of live vicariously through me. Uh -huh. So, he loaned me the money to start taking flying lessons. So, I've joked before that in high school, I learned how to fly airplanes. In college, I learned how to design airplanes. And in the Navy, I learned how to fight airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you get commissioned, and uh, what happens next? All right. So uh, from that point, I went down to Pensacola to start flight training. And with the Navy, uh, we branched things off depending on which uh, which type of aircraft you're going to be in. I remember you did a show about that a few weeks ago. So I went through uh, primary and intermediate there in Pensacola, and then I uh, got selected to go in the E-2 Hawkeye world. And for that, we go up to Norfolk, Virginia, to the fleet replacement squadron there to finish up our, our winging training and then also um, learning about the aircraft uh, specifically. Uh, did that and then uh, stayed there on the East Coast uh, with the VAW 123 screw tops and cruised on the USS John F. Kennedy. For my I first remember tour. that. <laughs> I yes. was with you. <laughs> and that's where we met. <laughs> that's yes, right. that's right. And then uh, after that, stayed there to be an instructor and then uh, moved out to the West Coast to be on a CAG staff. And from there, I kind of branched out to some other things. Uh, did that for a while, went to Naval Postgraduate School and studied modeling and simulation. And from there, then went down to do my department head tour in Point Magoo, California, and uh, then went to do some flight test on the latest version of the E-2, which is the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye. Oh, cool. After that, I got uh, selected for command, had the opportunity to go command a Navy recruiting district in the middle of the country. It was uh, NRD St. Louis, and we covered the territory in Kansas, Missouri, and southern half of Illinois. And then from there, went to be the operations officer on USS Carl Vinson. And that was where we got back in touch because you helped me hold my retirement ceremony on the Carl Vinson. That's while, right. <laughs> while it was still in port, thank you. So we definitely uh, spent a lot of time getting that coordinated, thanks. And then, uh, so now what are you doing? So now I'm uh, in program management. Uh, my time in flight test, I thought that was very 
interesting and rewarding work. Okay. I I kind of had this idea when I went into it that it would be just giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And, and you kind of hope that it's going to be a thumbs up because a lot of work has gone into getting this next version of the plane uh, ready. And, you know, of course, obviously, a lot of people would be disappointed if it turned out that that it wasn't good enough. What I didn't fully appreciate until I got there to Pax River was how much it is still a work in progress and how much we had the ability to kind of influence how things turned out and help the program office kind of prioritize which which pieces were important, which things needed to be worked on the most. And I thought that was really rewarding. I had a good time being able to talk to the engineers uh, and explain to them the impact of, of what certain things were happening and, and how that would affect uh, being able to use the plane operationally, but then also be able to go back and work with a class from Top Gun and, and test it in a realistic environment where we're doing you know real missions and stuff. So that was, uh, that was really appealing to me, um, and that's what made me want to go into the program management field. And, um, and that's where you are now? Yes, okay. that's where I am now. Awesome. So working software development over at, uh, at the Navy Space and uh, Naval Warfare uh, Systems Command. Okay. SPA War, I think we yes. call that. All right. And so just to clarify, you are a Naval Flight Officer. That is so correct. with regards to your E2 experience, I would argue you were actually more valuable than the guys up front because <laughs> they're just kind of driving the bus, but it's the three guys back in the tube that are really doing the big important work. Yeah. And that's what we're going to spend time talking about today. There's a few minutes at the beginning of the flight and a few minutes at the end of the flight that I would dispute that. <laughs> but especially all that part in the middle is, yeah, yeah we're pretty important. <laughs> especially when you're carrier based. But, and then also um, at some point you spent some time in Fallon, but you did not go through Top Gun necessarily, but something somewhat similar. Is that true? That's right. Uh, I did the uh, advanced mission commander course there, which is kind of the, uh, the E2 Hawkeyes version of Top Gun. Okay. Uh, and that's where we learn how to take that leadership role within the squadron and to be able to help train uh, all the other, especially the junior air crew, but, but really everybody, because even the old guys, they got to be refreshed on what's oh, yeah. going on now. Yeah. It's a perishable skill. Okay. So you went through the E2 communities version of Top Gun and have that patch and you learned some of the same skills, but probably a little different mindset, a little more strategic perhaps. It, it is. It, it talks a lot more about uh, the interaction with the rest of the Navy. So, okay. so that is definitely one thing about being a Hawkeye guy that, uh, that honestly I found pretty appealing over time as well is that it's like we're bilingual. You know, we, we spend half our time uh, talking tactical stuff with the fighter guys. And then the other half of the time we're talking, you know, more of that operational and, and technically not quite strategic, but, you know, up there in the, in the level of working with the strike group admiral and his staff and, right. and everything else to piece the whole thing in together for the big picture. And speaking of that, I had a question recently and I went ahead and took a stab at answering it via email by a fellow. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but I'm sure you can answer it. Um, he had said, you know, what happens when you get off the coast of somewhere. I mean, sometimes we're operating in international airspace, but we still have to coordinate. Is that an element of what you're talking about? Like if we pull off the coast of, let's say we're in the Mediterranean. I mean, there's a lot of traffic in there. Is part of what you do in that case, coordinating with other FAA equivalent type agencies, or does someone else on the ship take care of that? Well, I've I've gotten the chance to kind of do that from both sides there. So in the E2, sometimes, yes, you will wind up doing that. But really where a lot of that coordination happens was more to my time when I was the operations officer on the Carl Vinson, because air operations is one of the components of the operations department on a ship. And that is the part that is squarely in the middle of doing all that coordination, working with uh, the local areas where you're going to be operating and making sure that you're reserving airspace when necessary, uh, deconflicting airspace when necessary, and, and basically keeping the ship where it needs to be so that you're not getting into trouble. Because obviously, you shoot a guy off the pointy end of the ship, he, he doesn't have any control over where he's going to be for that first few seconds. You, you <laughs> got to make, make sure the ship's in the right place. Right. Okay. Well, I think I did answer that gentleman correctly. That sounds about like what I said. There is quite a bit of coordination that's involved. And then, of course, arguably, when we're off the coast of folks that we're not quite as friendly with, there's still a lot of coordination as we we develop our own procedures to make sure everything is deconflicted and we're not necessarily getting mm, permission, let's call it, from the host <laughs> nation there, but we still have a lot to coordinate. All right, so let's get on to the subject of the day. So we're going to talk air-to-air -air engagement communications. And so this being the Fighter Pilot Podcast, we will go with a scenario, let's say, where we have some fighters, and let's just call them Showtime. That will be their call signs. And it doesn't really matter what the bad guys are called. In training, of course, they'd have their own call signs, but let's assume this is maybe for real. And listeners to the show are familiar from Mongo's discussion on his Desert Storm MIG kill of reference points. And we're pretty used to using those, and we'll call our reference point Rock 
today. So that is just a point that we picked. It's not really important to say where or what it is, but we'll use Showtime and Rock for our examples. But before we get to that, a couple ways, if you are in the E2 and I and my wingman are flying along, a couple ways the three of us can communicate is, number one, I can look over at my wingman if he's close enough and give him hand signals. Now, generally, I don't fly close enough to the E2 to give hand signals. Right. Almost no reason that we ever fly together, except maybe in a photo exercise, I think is about the only time I've flown next right. to you guys. All right. But between the other F-18 and myself, I can do hand signals. Another way is data link. And... That link starts, you know, tickling on, you know, classified stuff. And we try to obviously be careful on this show not to discuss too much. But can you give kind of just a top down overview, unclassified, of course, of what kinds of nonverbal communication systems we have, or at least at least not which ones or what they're called, but generally how they kind of work. Right. So so that uh, data link is is definitely an important piece of it. If you can picture a top-down view of the world, which is the way I think most people would picture a radar display, uh, although it's a little different for the fighter, uh, he's got a different perspective, but uh, ours is that that standard top-down look at the world. And that is a way for us to look at what's out there and then report those tracks so that somebody else who's looking at another top-down view of the world can see the same thing that what we're seeing. And that's useful not only to the fighters, but it's also useful to the people back on the ship. They need to be able to see what's out there. Uh, the people who are sitting there in the Tactical Flag Command Center, which is the, the Admiral's battle watch, they want to know what's going on. Uh, the people who are in the combat direction center of the ship are going to want to know what's going on. You may have air intercept controllers that are on the destroyers or the cruiser that are wanting to know what's going on. You also have the air defense commander who is sitting on board a cruiser, and he's responsible for the overall air defense of the strike group. So he's going to want to see everything that's happening. That link is a really efficient way to be able to put that picture out so that we're all looking at the same thing. It's still a little bit of work involved because it's not completely automatic. You got to actually verify what is being shown, what, how your symbols are tracking, and make sure that they're doing the right thing. But we can send that, and then we can also send other discrete messages to the fighters or to somebody that's under our control, and we can tell them to go and fly in a certain direction. We can tell them to go intercept a certain track. Uh, we can give them some amplifying information about what that thing is. And there's different methods to do this, right? So we have uh, what used to be called Link 4 when That's I was right. a junior officer, and I believe now Link 16 and MIDS. And all these terms aren't really too important per se to, to the listener, but obviously if you're living in this world, you have to know all that stuff. And so you've got this network, if you will, and when I and my F-18 am powering up, I have to program my systems to kind of join in, right? So it's right. almost like getting on a Wi-Fi network, you have to know the password. I mean, that's a very simplified way of looking at it. But if I can jump in this network, these days, everything is adding a piece of the puzzle. So the E2 is out there, maybe that destroyer you talked about might be filling in a part. And then there might even be other players, I don't know, maybe space-based. I don't know what we can and cannot talk about in that regard. I just don't know what's classified, mm -hmm. but it's a giant network of information. Absolutely. And it used to be when you're talking about Link 4 that you were only getting to see a tiny, tiny little sliver of that information because it was just the nature of, of the comm link itself. It was, you know, just like you would expect anything that was designed in the 1960s or 70s or whenever <laughs> it was designed. Um, you couldn't pass that much, but I could maybe send you one track that you were interested in or that I wanted you to go investigate or something like that. Now with Link 16, we have a lot more bandwidth and we can actually show a lot more of the picture. The displays there in the in the fighter have changed as well. So you can see a little bit more of a global view of, of what's out there and, and know where to train your radar to look at what's actually interesting to you. Right. And that comes back to a point you made earlier in your previous discussion that I wanted to touch on, which is you are, and I like football analogies on this podcast for some reason. So you're kind of like the coach who's up in the, you know, press box or whatever, who's got a view of the whole thing down there and he can get on his radio and say, Hey, you need to do this. Now, maybe that's a bad analogy because I don't think they make inputs while the play is happening, <laughs> but you've got the, as you Depends said, on which team you're talking about. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that, but anyway, so you've got the 360 degree view of the battle space and vertically. So, you know, you really have the whole picture. Whereas I, and my F-18, at least, you know, most of my experience was before the links 16 and mids and all that was almost like I'm running around with my helmet on, but I really, you know, again, using the football analogy, maybe I've got a dark visor and maybe I just have a little 
opening in the middle of the visor where I can look and I have to kind of look left and right and up and down to try to build a picture. And you can tell me through link and also verbally, Hey, this is what you're seeing. And if you look in a certain place, you'll see this guy who's about to tackle you. I mean, is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, that's, that's a real good way to think about it. Like you said, you can only see a sliver of the information out there in front of you from your own radar at any given time. We're doing a 360 degree sweep for hundreds of miles. And that allows us to see a lot more of what's out there and kind of piece it together and figure out what's happening. So I might be able to describe to you, this is a little bit harder to do on a data link, but this is where the voice comms and the inflection come in. Right. But I might be able to describe for you what it looks like is developing. Because you take one snapshot in time and it may be, okay, there's one guy here, there's another guy over here, but I can start to see, okay, this guy's kind of tracking over this way, this guy's heading this way, and I can tell you what it's developing into. And I think that's probably where it's going to give you the most situational awareness as you anticipate what's turning out in front of you. Perfect. And that is a great segue into our scenario for today. So again, let's say we are just to kind of cage our imaginary vision here of what we're looking at. Let's say Rock is in the middle and we are to the south heading north and the bad guys are originating somewhere north of Rock, let's say. So in that example, let's say I just get done on the tanker. You've already been airborne for a cycle because you guys are generally up there a lot, you know, getting the picture done and, and being ready. And I check in with you and, you know, we can skip any kind of administrative checks, but there would be some, hey, this is me. That's you. Okay. Yeah. Let's make sure our systems jive. Okay. Yeah. We're good to go. But once we tell you, okay, you know, picture, right? And that's, that is a request in a sense. You're going to, correct me if I'm wrong, give sort of a, a, a broadcast general view of what's out there because I might be south of rock, but maybe another element, let's call them, it doesn't matter what we call them, but let's say someone else is out there. If you just tell me where something is relative to me, it doesn't help anyone else, right? That's so the right. initial calls here as we go through this imaginary scenario of an intercept are going to be what broadcast type control? That's right. So the broadcast control is, is not specific to anybody's single perspective and it's just kind of letting everybody know what's going on. It's before anyone has actually taken any action or made any decision to do anything about the picture that's out there. They're just trying to build up that mental image of what's out there and what could potentially turn towards them and become a factor. Right. Okay. So just to put a little more teeth on this scenario, let's say that, in fact, anything north of an east-west line through rock is where the bad guys are going to originate. And maybe we'll just call this a defensive mission. So we're just kind of hanging back. And now, so maybe in the lane I happen to be in for this defensive counter air, someone starts heading towards me. And now we need to go into something a little more specific. So what would next transition in this scenario here? Well, generally, at some point, you would make a decision whether you're going to commit on that group or not. And you might have several groups out there, and there may be some of them that may be more tactically interesting or tactically important than others. And that's where, you know, you as the uh, the fighter lead, and then me as the air intercept control, or we're going to work together to decide what is most important and where your attention needs to be focused. Sometimes that's going to be really obvious to you. Sometimes it takes a guy that's sitting and looking at a little bit more impartial view of the world to realize what's going to be the most important important thing the soonest. Right. So we as the fighters will commit, as we call it, and you can certainly recommend a commit. Now, before we get into the tactical part of this, though, let, let's talk about calm brevity, because that's an important part of this. We have on this show discussed landing signal officers, and the terminology they use is very precise because it has to be. Right. We have seconds, and we need to know exactly what it means to do it. Arguably, that is true here, although certainly at 100 miles or more away, it's not so critical, but as we get closer and closer to each other, it does. But what's, I mean, I kind of already answered it, but what, what's the point of the calm brevity and, and how does it play into what we, you and I, are using here in communications in this scenario? Well, it serves a couple of purposes. One of them is the very same thing that you're talking about with the LSOs, because you have a very precise language and the words mean the same thing each time. And that's important because you don't want to say something that's ambiguous and then have the person that's on the other end of the control not really understand what you meant by that. So the standardization piece is really important. The other thing is just the practical aspect of I mean, we've all talked to somebody before that just seems like they're going on and on. <laughs> you don't want to be having a trouble following where are they going with this? When are they going to get to the point? It needs to be clear and concise and shortened to the point because you need time to think about what you're doing in the cockpit. I need time to continue to adjust my system and we don't need to spend the whole time with our 
gums flapping. <laughs> and I use on this show, you've listened, you know, in the little opening bumpers, I play comms from real engagements. And that's part of the reason we train with this discipline is we hope that in reality, someday, we'll have the ability to have some white space, if you will, on the radios, so that important calls can be made. But in reality, when the chips are really down, it, it could get very convoluted quickly. And, and again, I've put examples of that in our bumpers on the intro. Um, well, and that's, and that's another point, too, is yeah. the fact that um, you need to have some dead air in there so that if somebody else has something that they've got to jump in, maybe it's your wingman who is seeing something that neither you nor I is seeing, they need a chance to get in the radio and be able to say it too. Right. So then that is then a segue into my next point, which is priorities, right? right. So while the bad guys are north of rock and I'm hanging out on my cap, pretty much you have the radio priority at that point. Is that true? Yes. And because again, at that point, I'm describing what is going on and it's a kind of a generic description. You mentioned earlier, there may be more than one cap section out there. Uh, so things are going to be important to different people at different times. Uh, but we want to make it just kind of generic so that everybody can see what's going on. Once we start to actually initiate that intercept, then at that point, that comm priority is going to shift because now there's some definitive action that is being taken and you're going to need to be able to communicate with your team, you know, your wingmen, your division, whatever you're with, uh, how you expect them to execute this engagement. Okay. And we would have briefed that, of course. So let's say in our scenario, as we continue to kind of put pieces of the puzzle together, that there are two groups that we care about north of rock separated by say 20 miles north and south and then maybe there's a group or two out to the east and a group or two out to the west so in broadcast control you might with your own cadence and training say okay hey, everybody here's the picture and you're going to anchor them off of rock right so you might say uh screw top was your old call sign right picture group and then you know what rock zero nine zero twenty five with an altitude and what they're doing, like right. capping or something like that. Yes, so it's always, right. what, the bearing, the range, and then will we still throw on altitude? It's been a little while since I've thought about this, if we have it, right? Yes, if that's available. Okay, and then what they're doing. So they might be capping. And again, we don't want to say that they're hot, which is the term for heading at me, because they might be hot on one element, but not the other. Correct. So while you're just doing broadcast control, you're just going to hey, say, hey, everybody, here's all these different groups that are out there, and here's kind of what they're doing generally. But now in my scenario, you look at those two that are coming towards rock, and you say, hey, showtime, you know, Here's here's a group. Here's another group. Recommend commit. So if, if I'm sitting back there, you know, with my mask dangling off, not really thinking about anything, which I shouldn't be, but you know, <laughs> if for whatever reason you need to do an electronic slap, you can say, hey, recommend commit. In other words, they meet your criteria. You should probably forget about everybody else and now take this commit on this element. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then at that point, how does the calm transition, or what is it? How does it change at that point? Well, at that point, it's going to start to become uh, focused on your perspective. Uh, we'll continue to use rock as a reference point. Uh, in the older days, uh, the systems were not designed to use that as, as easily. It was a lot easier to just give it to you in what we call bra format, bearing range altitude from you. From my nose, right. For, right. But now the systems have evolved. The software is different inside. It, it is, it's still easier to continue using that, uh, that rock as a reference point. So we'll do that. And... And then that information is still valuable to everybody else as well, because they're going to want to know about what's happening. If you're going to go do a visual uh, ID on somebody, they're going to want to know where this thing is that's about to get identified. Right. So in my example, if you were to say, you know, uh, Showtime, recommend commit, then we say commit, then you might say, and I'll take a stab at this. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, of course, you don't know what the distance is, but whatever I go with will work. Uh, so it might be what? Screw top, two groups, range 20 lead group, rock, 36010, hot, hostile, you're going to declare them now, right, coming at me, trail group, whatever fill-ins, you don't have to tell me where they are off of rock. And then in this example, once you pause after that call, you might say additional group over here and another group over there, screw top monitoring, letting me know that, okay, there's two guys that you care about, they're in a range of 20 miles, these other two groups you don't care about, and these are the two that I'm going to label as groups in range, and I'm going to name them the lead group and the trail group. Am I remembering this correctly? Yes, that's right. And and that's where that format starts to change kind of subtly, because like you said, we're still referencing things off of the same bullseye point. But at this point now, we're no longer describing it as just a generic picture out there with, I've got this guy at this location and this other guy. Now we're starting to describe what the picture looks like from your perspective, because that's going to influence how you decide to tackle this problem. 
Okay. And so now as we commit, and on this episode, we're not going to talk about the employment. So it's not important how we engage these two groups. And in the brief, we would have said, if we see two groups in range, here's how we'll handle them. So we'll handle them. But let's just say for the sake of today's discussion, that as this intercept is consummated, now the comm priorities we talked about before will shift. That's right. And one of the other things that's happening as you are trying to direct the rest of your flight, what you're going to do and and telling who's going to target what and who's going to fly in what direction, we will be sitting there talking to the rest of the command structure for the strike group. So we may be talking back to the air defense commander at that point on a different radio to either get further clarification on their commander's intent uh, or to get further information on declaration criteria. We may have... uh, resources available to us that we can be talking on an additional radio to try to piece together a little bit more of what we're seeing so that you're not going into that intercept completely blind. You want to know that it's not just a hunk of metal out there, but you'd prefer to have some idea of what that hunk of metal is. So we're trying to piece together all of that on another radio while this is going on. So Niles, if you're communicating with me as my controller, is that literally you pushing another button and doing different talk? Or is it the two guys sitting in the tube back there with you that are helping out here? Or are they doing maybe other elements of fire? It depends on the specific mission. Most of the time, the person that is acting as the air intercept controller is going to be primarily focused on that task. And they're going to be working together as a crew. And it may actually be the guys in the front end. You know, we joke about them being the bus drivers, but the pilots in the E2 community have gotten a lot more tactically savvy over the years as well. They may be talking on another net and trying to help build that picture as well. But we'll work together as a crew. The SECO, the the Combat Information Center officer, who's the mission commander of the flight, he may be talking back to the air defense commander and getting that information on commander's intent, what they want to do with this particular track. Whereas the RO, the radar officer, who is the most junior of the NFOs in the back, he may be busy on a completely different mission, talking to helicopters that are going to identify the the surface picture at that given time or something like that. Okay. So it just depends on what theater we're in, how busy it is. Is this a full up shooting war or do we have enough assets, et cetera? Okay. So you guys will be generally there helping us out and doing a lot of those background communications that are so important. And then I think you you touched on this, but there's two important things here also is you need to identify who these folks are. Now, we've talked on the show before about the difference between bogeys, bandits, and hostiles. So they're familiar with that. But there's another element, which is if you can get some sort of purple information, and this is, again, where we have to be a little careful, but if you can figure out what they are, not just are they hostile or not, but hey, these are hostile and they're this type of airplane, that can be very useful information for us because then we know what type of threat we're facing. Exactly. Uh, That could dictate the tactics that you're using. It can also dictate uh, priority on other tracks that may be out there and what we're going to do with those. Right. So in our example, if we are on a defensive counter air mission and our real goal here is to protect the carrier, well, if you know that one element are fighters and another are strikers with anti-ship missiles, those guys are going to be the priority. Right. That's going to drive the tactics and drive uh, the employment. We'll all talk about that in the brief before the mission, right. what the priorities are going to be for that day. But when it comes to actual game time, then that's when we've got to piece it all together. Sure. And conversely, if we are out stirring up the hornet's nest, let's say, because we want to send some strikers in to bomb a target over their homeland sometime in the future, the priorities might be the most capable air-to-air fighters that are out there. And so that tipper or purple can be very informative. All right. So... As we begin to employ weapons as the fighters here, the showtimes are going to shoot and do whatever maneuvers they need to do. And it's really, again, for this sake of discussion, not important what. But at that point, your role as a communicator has essentially taken, I won't call it a back seat because I don't want to say you're not important, but is it safe to say the fighters have the priority here? Because we need to employ on a timeline that helps us be as offensive as we can. And at that point, if we see in our employing missiles there's not really too much we need from you unless there's someone else that's shown up, right? That's exactly right. Our whole job is to help enhance your situational awareness so that you can employ effectively. If everything is going well, then by the time that this decision is made for you to go and and commit on an intercept, you probably have a pretty good idea what's happening. And as the intercept unfolds, you continue to have a good idea what's happening there. If something changes there and we can see that you don't have awareness to something, uh, there's maybe a pop-up group. Maybe he was you know, low in the valleys and everybody's radar was kind of canceling him out because they thought it was ground clutter. And all of a sudden he pops up and you realize, oh, got another thing here that's going to change the picture. That's the kind of example where, okay, we need to 
jump in and let you know what's happening. But other than that, if you've got it under control, then there's nothing else to really add to the picture at that point. Awesome. And even to the point where if we end up at a merge, well, you might hear a bunch of that, again, terminology I sometimes throw on the uh, intro bumpers where it's, you know, elevated pitch in our voices, we're turning and shooting and defending all these things. And again, unless someone else is going to come up and jump into this fist fight, you're going to pretty much kind of listen and just kind of hang out for the time being. That's right. Because when things are far apart, we probably have more awareness of what's happening. But as it starts to get closer together and you're actually within the visual uh, arena there, you have a better idea of what you're seeing than what we do. We're seeing some radar tracks, but I don't know anything about what, you know, where they are necessarily in relation to you exactly. Like he's, he's right above your right wing or something. I, I can't see that level of detail. You have the most awareness at that point, what's going on. All right. So in our example, let's say we've vanquished the lead group and we go through there. We've got to do a little bit of sanitization to make sure we see everything in front of us as we kind of progressively open our eyes to look around because we just got done with this knife fight, if you will. Then we might ask you for what's going on with that trail group. Exactly. So as you come out of that and kind of, uh, you know, take a breath and, and say, okay, I'm ready to recage my my awareness of what's going on, because you can imagine that your situational awareness is probably shrinking down to a point where you could call it a very dense level of essay. You've got a huge amount of essay, what's going on right in your immediate vicinity, and almost no essay as to what's going on anywhere else, because that's where your attention is solely focused at that moment. It's our job to stand back, look at the big picture, and as you come out of it, like, okay, what's next? Then we can tell you, all right, this is what's happening. You know, turn this way, go this direction, and you got this guy over here. Awesome. Yeah, dense is probably the best way to put that. <laughs> I never thought of it like that, but that makes really perfect sense. All right, and in that case, if... In my previous example, these guys were 20 miles apart, and I come out of that, of course, that trail group is closing on us all along. Are you going to, when I ask you, hey, what's going on with them, are you going to reference them off of rock necessarily? I mean, it's kind of a nebulous question, but... It depends on what's briefed ahead of time, uh, because the idea is we want to go in with a game plan where you and I are expecting the same thing to happen throughout the flight. And we try to make sure that the information we're giving you is what you were expecting to see or hear at some certain point in time. Depending on how that's briefed, you may at that point give a broad direction just because that's that's the most basic level kind of a thing to say, hey, turn to the east uh, or whatever direction it is. Uh, but if it was briefed to go the other way to use a reference point, then we'll do that. And then, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, inside a certain range, you're probably just going to give me bra anyway because then if I ask for it in one format and you give it to me in the other – By the fact of you doing that kind of implies to me, hey, these guys are getting in your knickers. That's right. I mean, you can think about it as having various levels of abstraction with this communication and the information that's being presented. As things are far apart and all you see is a radar track, that's probably the most abstract that the information is ever going to be. As you get in closer, things are going to start to shrink down and you want to make it so that this really kind of comes down to a human factors thing, but you want to make it so that the other person has to think as little as possible or jump through as little hoops as possible in order to understand what's happening. If you start to get to the point where it's so time critical that I don't need you jumping through different layers of software in your plane or something. I just need you to get going this way because here's the closest alligator to the canoe. Then we'll do it that way. And, and that brings up a point that I wanted to cover today at some point anyway. I'll do it now, which is plain English. Right? Exactly. So we have calm brevity, we have cadence, we have all these different ways of doing what we do. But sometimes when it comes right down to it, plain English still works. That's right. Uh, a good example here, or maybe it's a counter example, if you want to think of it that way, is during the time that I was an instructor in the fleet replacement squadron, we would take student NFOs into the back of the uh, the aircraft or in the simulator or the back of the aircraft. And particularly in the simulator, where we can create really rich and complex scenarios, arguably just as complex as the kinds of things that a strike group does when they're on workups to go out on deployment. But, you know, these are brand new JGs who've hardly seen anything, uh, you know, might even still be ensigns at that point. They don't have a lot of experience, but they're getting thrown right into the fire to do this kind of stuff. It was not unusual to see students who would get so wrapped around the axle trying to find the perfect thing to say that they just don't say anything. Ooh, that's and worse. <laughs> exactly. And then as the situation unfolds, you know, you've got these, uh, you know, old retired guys that are the simulator instructors in the back that are driving the problem and everything. And and they're playing the part of the fighters on on the other end of the radio for them. And 
and they'll go through it and they're like, Hey, give me a picture. And they're, they're getting cranky because right. you know, you're not telling them what they need to know. And, and the student will just sit there and get paralyzed. And then you take that back and you debrief it and, and you walk them through what happened there. And sometimes it is just as simple as use plain English. If there's not a pre-made phrase that describes what's happening, just use regular words so that you get the message across because that's ultimately the most important piece. And then you can also, in that same vein, if you really had to use, you know, again, on Mongo's example, of course, that was back in 1991, but they were using side numbers because just, you know, they're getting a stem power. Mm -hmm. And I don't know your system very well, but, you know, if you look down and you see the guy's side number, you just couldn't think what you were supposed to call him, you could do that. Or in your case, like, Jello, look out the right side. You're going to die. <laughs> right. I don't want to go tell <laughs> yeah. Beth that you're about, you know, that you're going to die. So, you know, you can use personal call signs, you can use plain English, you can use side numbers if you had to. But, that all being said, in training, and I know you've been through this too, we go out and we strive for those perfect calls. So, you know, your, your new guys, your, your Lieutenant JGs and Ensigns, they're not there yet. They don't have the experience, but that's what you're developing. Right. So by the time you go to Fallon, you go out and maybe you get a little bit of that again because in the heat of the moment, even though it's training, you forget what it is or whatever. But Lord knows you get back in that debrief or we're going to pick that apart and say, here's how we should have done it. And the idea being, hey, we're going to sweat in training so we don't bleed in combat. And that's why we strive for those perfect calls in the perfect format at the perfect time, et cetera. Absolutely. Just like anything else, the more times you practice something, the more natural it will become. And it does become kind of like a second language to you that you can speak fluently and, and you just think that way. You don't have to go through that extra level of abstraction of trying to translate what you want to say into these other sets of words. Right. So if I'm flying with you one day and let's say an Air Force E2 AWACS the next day, should I expect generally similar calm brevity terms and cadences and whatnot? Yes, you should. Uh, we have a standardized manual that works across uh, all the services. The It's called the ALSA manual. I think it stands for Air, Land, Sea, Application, application, I think it was the okay, A. Yeah. I can't remember what the last A was, but the also Com Brevity Manual is the gold standard there. Uh, I was kind of surprised that it's actually an unclassified document, but we speak on unclassified nets, uh, right. so I guess that makes sense. But it's just a standard list of the brevity terms that we use for pretty much everything out there. Some of them make sense. Some of them you have no idea where they came <laughs> up with these words, but after a while, you just begin to think of that as a first language. Right. And again, it takes some practice and repetition and debriefing, and eventually you can get good at this, but it's never perfect. You know, it's like almost anything. You, you strive for perfection and you hope it's good enough. And someday when the balloon goes up, then you rely on that muscle memory from training. Right. When it matters. And, and if you're routinely using the correct or the standardized way of saying things, then that becomes normal. And one of the things that is also important in communications is not just saying the right words in the right order, but using a voice inflection that that can communicate information as well. I mean, everybody knows that there's there's a lot of information that is communicated with body language when you're talking to somebody just face to face. The same idea is true over the radio because inflection makes all the difference in the world. If you have somebody that is just talking in a robotic tone of voice, monotone, every word has exactly the same level of emphasis. First of all, it's hard for the other person to actually pay attention to that. It, it becomes <laughs> e easy to just lose track of what they're saying. I think anyone who sat out. in a classroom with a boring teacher can uh, validate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but secondly, it denies the person that is communicating or, or trying to communicate the ability to really grab the other person and shift their attention to what the most important piece is. So that voice inflection gives you the chance, if you use it sparingly, to be able to turn them over and say, hey, this is where you need to focus your attention right now. We've gone from routine, mundane communications to all of a sudden, okay, this is starting to get interesting, kind of a thought process. And that'll start to change your mindset as well. So the other part of that is that if you've been using standardized communications the whole time and then suddenly the situation is developing in a way that maybe doesn't fit the standard script and you're trying to get that across, then breaking from that standard com brevity and just using plain English, that's one of those things that just like voice inflection will help communicate to the person what's actually going on. So something a little different, again, to kind of get the fighters, in this case, attention to say, Oh, wow. You know, Niles just switched to non-standard or he just called me Jello. I, I, like, you know, come shake my head out of the cobwebs. What's going on? What's different here? Right. It's the same thing with LSOs we've talked about on the show. I mean, the word power, and you've probably even heard it from inside the E2 before. It, there's so many different ways to say it. And they all right. have so many different meanings, essentially. And so you guys have that little bit of, you know, so much of this is the manual and it's very black and white. This word means this. 
and it is very standardized. But then when you become a master at something, that's when you can put your own little artistic, hey, when I inflect a certain way here, I find that the fighters do this thing. Wasn't there like a red crown guy back in Vietnam? Of course, this was way back before we were very good, but he kind of figured this out early, didn't he? That if he said things a certain way, that he was very effective with his fighters and probably the same for you guys today. Yeah, absolutely. And and you mentioned the Vietnam era. That is really when we really started to, to develop the art of air intercept control and being able to, to make the fighters more effective by broadening their, their view of the world. Okay. So let's get back to our scenario. Uh, my wingman and I are doing good work today. We take care of the lead group. We flow through. We take care of the trail group. And we, again, ask you for a picture. Now, at this point, there's obviously, depending on the real picture, what the, the situation is, there's, there's different scenarios. But what, just give us a couple examples of what could uh, transpire next. So at that point, if those were the only two things of interest that were out there, it may be as simple as just a picture clean call and letting them know that, all right, there's nothing else out there. Go ahead and reset back to your cap station and we'll continue on uh, business as usual. You start to think about admin issues at this point, too, because if you just went and executed this intercept, then fuel may become a factor and we may need to start thinking about who's going to come and refuel you. And if we are the air intercept controller for more than one cap station at once, you kind of start to get into that chess game of, okay, I'm thinking about this guy may be out of the fight for a few minutes because he's going to be refueling. So let's start uh, concentrating on this guy and then where are they on fuel? And you start to work through those problems. But assuming that that's not an issue, then the main point is just to communicate what else is out there. Uh, it may be that you've got some calm air flying by and you're going to want to let them know that that's there, but then again, reassure them that it's no big deal. It's just a calm air on a calm air route. All right. So picture clean is, Hey dudes, you guys are good to go. No one's nearby you. You're fine. Why don't you take a breath, figure out some of that administrative stuff and head back. The opposite of that would be a threat call. Tell us about that one real quick. Absolutely. So a threat call is going to be one of those things that, A, it's probably going to be uh, referenced off of where the fighter is because we're down to the point where we just need you to snap in a certain direction and honor that threat. And secondly, voice inflection is going to play a key role here as well because, uh, again, if we're inside the range, and, and there's a lot of math that goes into this that's all worked out ahead of time. We're not sitting there with slide rules or calculators in the plane. But, you know, there are people back at Top Gun that are doing the math to figure out that this is the range you need to do this and this is the range you need to do that once you start to get inside some of those ranges it creates a different and more tactically challenging problem for you so we need to be able to alert you to that fact and get you to start to modify what you're doing right and is that range just based purely off of it's like maybe a super fast airplane it could be. Uh, it's going to depend on the situation that we're that we're briefing to and what the expected intel picture is but uh you're generally going to define that range off of what you consider to be the most capable threat that you may be actually facing there. Right. But what I was trying to get you to say was it's not necessarily the speed of the airplane, but the missile most likely that oh, it's going to fire at you. Right. So right. Right. You might have for whatever reason, a very capable aircraft, but if we happen to know that it only has certain types of missiles, well then that's less of a threat to us than that very same airplane with some very, very capable missiles. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the two things kind of go hand in hand and, and that's the way that we think of it, whether we're talking to, to the Intel folks before a mission or, or working with you throughout the mission is it, we think of them as almost paired systems. Right. Okay. So we could go with that threat call. And again, voice inflection. And I've heard it plenty of times in training. Uh, you know, hey, dude, you've got this over here. I haven't talked about him before, but now he's an issue. And that can be whether I'm pointing at him or running away. But conversely, getting back to the picture clean, then, hey, reset back to cap, take a breath, figure out what your fuel and your weapons are. And then you're going to, at that point, transition back to broadcast control. That's right. And it may be a good opportunity also to, to kind of relabel everything as a new picture, because as things develop, it may start to become a little bit complicated uh, and, and harder to picture. You may have, you, you think you're dealing with two, and then suddenly now there's a third one that's involved. And it, you may have labeled that at some point as an additional group. Well, that gets kind of convoluted to continue calling something an additional group all the time. So getting that chance to kind of reset and just like, okay, let's wipe the slate, you know, rip the piece of paper off of the, uh, the easel there and it's start with a new, <laughs> new picture. And that can provide the opportunity for everybody to reset their mindset. Okay. So for example, in our earlier scenario, we had two groups, we were calling that in range lead and trail. Let's say we were just hanging out and then they maneuver and all of a sudden they're East and West of each other. You're saying you could come back and say two groups, is that azimuth? I forgot. It would be at that okay, point. Okay, two yeah. groups in azimuth. Now you might call them what? An east group and a west group? 
That's right. If okay. that was an appropriate time to, to make that. Sometimes the situation will develop and and it's not a convenient time to relabel it everything because it's just going to become more confusing to everyone. A minute ago, he was the lead group. Now I'm calling him the West group. Just pick something and stick with it, even if geographically those labels don't make as much sense anymore. But you want to stick with it so that people can keep track of who we're talking about. But if there is that chance to break back and, and reset, pick something that makes more sense now. That's an opportunity yes. to do it. And that, again, is part of the art of this for you guys is do I or do I not potentially scramble people's minds here by making a new picture call? Because even though the lead guy is now directly a beam, the trail guy, well, it's almost an arbitrary name if you really think about it. I mean, it started with a geographic relationship, but we might as well call them Fred Group and Barney Group because it almost doesn't matter anymore. But we need to know when you say the lead group or the Fred Group who you're talking about. Absolutely. Because the... Correlation is a big part of this, which we didn't really talk about on here. But, you know, when when you are anchoring things off of rock, as you said, I have systems to tell me, okay, that's these guys here. But in my aircraft, I need to keep situational awareness to that because if you tell me they're hostile, but somewhere else is a bogey group and I employ on the wrong group because I'm not correlated, then that obviously is a big problem because that's how the incorrect people get engaged, which could be either white air or friendly or something else. And we certainly don't want to employ against the wrong group. All right. So I have a couple listener questions here. I don't normally do this with my guests, but these were specific to communications. But before we go into them, realizing, Niles, that you and I could probably talk for hours on this, I think we've gotten the general point of fighter communication across. And we tried to draw a distinction between defensive missions like our scenario and offensive. Anything you think is relevant that I didn't cover that maybe would be important to to bring out here before we go into some listener questions? Like you said, we could talk about this for hours, but I think you've probably covered most of it. That would be good, uh, good one-on-one case study for sure. people. Okay, because you know, golly, if you're doing a self-escort strike or you've got other groups in the DCA that we were talking about, I mean, there's so many variables. And what is the threat? What are we defending? What are we attacking? Do we have F-22s with us? Maybe they offer a little more than that soda straw that I have to look through in my older F-18. I know the newer F-18s do a little better with their electrically scanned array radars, but there's so many variables. No two missions, I would argue, are the same, even arguably the very two identical missions and training with the same scenario, like in a Top Gun course, you might have the same scenario, but as long as the players are different, and by that I mean the people in the airplanes, they're never going to go exactly the same. That's right. It's kind of funny as you get into this, you know, when you're brand new or when you're outside of it altogether and you're picturing going into it one day, you think that, okay, well, this is going to be really complicated tactics and it's going to be, you know, this chess game of aerial combat and everything. And as you get into it, you realize that actually it's a lot of pre-planned responses that you just kind of execute certain plays over and over again. But then you get to that next level of understanding about the whole field and you realize that there are these little nuances that even though they might not sound radically different to a layperson, that they're the things that keep it interesting and, and make it different from time to time and why you're not exactly doing the same thing every time, but it's knowing when to apply those nuances and do things just a little bit differently that kind of makes the right. difference. And I would argue, again, going back to football, that you know Tom Brady, for example, in his 19th season as a quarterback, sees the field way differently with his experience and, of course, certainly several Super Bowl championships and MVPs than, say, Josh Rosen on the Arizona Cardinals, who's first year out of UCLA, who is still, everything is new and overwhelming and, you know, he doesn't Mm -hmm. see the pocket collapse. So some of it is experience. Right. And a lot of it is training because Tom Brady certainly trained a lot more than Josh has. And some of it is luck, arguably. And then some of it is just your own personal dedication to your craft. That's right. Awesome. All right. So I have two questions here I want to pose to you. One is from James Wolf, who says, I understand that due to the octal based IFF system, octal meaning eight, that existed with the E2 when it first came into service, Navy aircraft were limited to zero through seven in terms of numbers they could use on the sides of the aircraft and as IFF identifiers. So IFF being identification friend or foe. 
However, I've heard rumors that there have been upgrades since that time that allow for modexes to finally use eight and nine integers. So Niles, for everyone else who uh, isn't as familiar and what I told James in my email when I said I'd pose this to you is so, for example, when I was in VFA 94, or let's use the squadron we were, uh, the air wing we were in together, VFA 86, I was in the, the Sidewinders. Our side numbers were the 400 series. That's right. So we had 400, 401 through 407. We skipped 408 and 409, but then we went 410, 411, et cetera. And so James' question is, are we beyond that now? Short answer is no. It's interesting, you know, you attribute it to the E2 when it came into service. It's not really the E2 specifically. It's just the uh, the whole IFF system as a whole, which is used by ships. It's used by the E2. We are one of the interrogators. The, uh, the ships are interrogators. There can be land-based interrogators. But the point is, it's just a, a standard that was developed. And yes, it's octal because when you get down to the beeps and squeaks, it's just pulses of radio signals that are being sent out and so the pulse is either off or on and that means that you're going to go with a with a binary kind of a basis and so it's going to be powers of two and for whatever reason they just, just where they thought a good number to stop would be is they made it so that it would be what is that a three-bit number yeah so three bits would be you know two to the third power so eight All right. Um, and so, interestingly, the 757 and 767 that I now fly, our mode three IFF is very much the same, four digits and zero through seven. That's right. It's, it's the same thing that uh, air traffic control is using for all the civilian aircraft out there. Now, arguably, that's a little different now with mode S uh, coming into play, mm -hmm. but the traditional IFS systems that we have been using and, and what we would call mode three and mode Charlie, which right. is what all the civilians use. And the mode Charlie tells you the altitude and the mode three is just a, a four digit number that is assigned so that air traffic control can tell who's who we use the same kind of a thing for the military. We have that. And then we have a few other modes too. That's just a little bit different pulse pattern, how right. it's interrogating, but the same kind of information is being relayed. Okay. So we probably won't see any 408 or 409s on the uh, flight deck. Probably for not. For a while. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then the only other question I have regarding this aviation communication stuff in your experience in the E2 is uh, from Christian Etelt or Etelt. Here in Europe, there are frequent encounters in international airspace with Russian long-range bombers, fighters, or surveillance aircraft on training missions, i.e. the Tu-95, the IL-20, Su-27. And so first off, Christian, I'm not so sure those are necessarily training missions, but anyway, <laughs> his question continues. Uh, they would cross busy airspace over the Baltic Sea or Atlantic Ocean, where all transatlantic traffic passes through. They are obviously not in contact local ATC anywhere, and that is why fighters from the various NATO countries are sent to intercept them. How do they avoid traffic? European airspace usually wouldn't assume any VFR or visual flight rules traffic up at 30,000 feet and higher. Isn't the whole thing a little reckless, crossing busy airways with transponders turned off and without any radio contact? So not just in Europe, but also we get folks flying over Alaska. And I don't know, there's some kind of open skies thing too, maybe you can answer about, but this is certainly a concern, I would think. Yes. Uh, so the a little bit of a loaded question there, especially there at the end, but uh, is it a little reckless? Eh, maybe. It depends on uh, how you look at it. That is part of the reason that we get concerned, of course, and we want to keep track of who is where so that we don't have any safety of flight incidents. Uh, you're right, there is an open skies treaty that has uh, for years allowed the U.S. and Russia to be able to overfly each other's airspace, uh, but when they do that, they're going to be talking to somebody. Um, but back to the, to the question here, what they're doing is they're operating VFR due regard, which means that when you're in international airspace, uh, you don't have to be talking to anybody. Countries will set up uh, an ADES, an Air Defense Identification Zone, which is a self-declared piece of airspace that goes out a certain distance, and it depends. It's not a standard number, but the country decides what they think is appropriate. They'll put that out and say, if anyone comes within this area, I'm going to come check out who you are and what you're doing. A commercial airliner is going to be talking to air traffic control the whole time, and there's not really going to be any question. So there's about no that. doubt who that is. Exactly. But if you got somebody else, you got this non squawking aircraft that's just flying towards you, yeah, you know, the country is going to take an interest in that. Now, that is not something that is settled international law by any means. It's not to say that you know, it's illegal for you to operate within another country's ADIS. In fact, you get sometimes uh, occasionally uh, where 
different ADISs may overlap each other, you know, so it's, it doesn't mean that it's your territorial airspace. It's just the country deciding that this is an area that we're concerned about. And if you fly here, we're going to come check out and see who you are. What they'll typically do, though, is, first of all, they may not be talking to air traffic control, but that doesn't mean that they're not talking to a ground controlled intercept uh, of some sort, you know, back on on their end, where that GCI controller may be using a long range radar and giving them some cueing of what's out there. Uh, certainly, when you're talking about something like an SU-27, well, they have a radar on board of their own, and they may not be able to see everything that's out there simultaneously, but they can at least see who's in front of them. So the odds of them just randomly running into somebody because they didn't see them is pretty low. When they start to do something else, like let's say that they're intercepting a U.S. Navy aircraft, like a P-3 or something. Just happened, like in the last week. <laughs> exactly. So they do something like that. Well, now you're getting into a different sort of a situation. It may be international airspace, and both parties have every right to be there. It's not that one guy is intruding on the other ones, but there may be a certain vested interest that they have in not wanting you there, and we may have a certain vested interest in wanting to be there, whether that's to establish freedom of navigation or whether that is to keep an eye on what's going on in the area, whatever. We may both have our reasons to want to operate in that airspace at the same time. When they start to do that intercept, generally there will be you know certain rules of professionalism that are out there about how that intercept would be conducted and you do it in a way at least we would if it was operating the other way around we're keeping an eye on someone that's you know encroaching on our territorial airspace then we would execute that intercept in a way that's not going to put the other aircraft in danger you would hope that they're going to do the same thing sometimes they may sometimes you might start to get the hairs in the back of your neck raised because they're not quite operating the way you would hope they would operate. That all is situationally dependent. Right. Yep. I think to your point is it's a matter of professionalism. Like, hey, we're both allowed to be here, but if you're going to continue to do afterburner passes across my nose, then that's a little bit threatening and unsafe, mm -hmm. frankly, and there's no need to put airmen uh, at risk. So, The all last right. thing about that mm -hmm. is that you don't want to create a situation where intent becomes a question. Uh, you don't want it to be something where the person that is in that aircraft that is being intercepted does not know whether you have hostile intent or not, like right. like this other aircraft that's coming out towards us or if we're going to intercept them. You definitely don't want to create that perception. If one thinks that this is just a routine intercept, I'm just checking out who you are, and then the other one thinks that he's about to get shot, the situation could escalate in a way that none of us want to have happen. Excellent. All right, Niles, this has been a really interesting discussion. I, I, I wonder if some people, when they see the title of this episode, are going to be fearful that they're going to fall asleep, but I think this has been really exciting. So thanks for that. We have two final questions we always ask our guests, but before we do, anything you want to cover on the air intercept communications or anything about the backside of the E2 there or your, your own experiences that we didn't cover today? No, like I said... Um you know, going back to flight school days, you know, when when you're getting picked out for, you know, which who's going to go to which platform, the E-2 is not the most glamorous plane in the Navy. So, you know, people may look at that and say, gosh, I, I don't know if that's what I want to do. Once you get into it, though, there's an old saying in the Navy, uh, especially among the enlisted ranks, but it, it kind of applies everywhere that, uh, you know, the the best rate is the rate that you're in. Right. right. So, um you kind of get that sense after a while as you start to develop the experience and the professionalism within that particular community, you realize that there are a lot of interesting things that you get to do. Like I said early on, I may not have the the big bubble canopy where I can see out in the world and, and get all that kind of exciting stuff that attracts people to naval aviation in the first place, but I do still get to fly around the carrier. You get the cat shots and the traps, and, and you get to be part of the missions in a very, very important way and, and a very integrated kind of a, kind of a way. But beyond that, I'm not just talking to the air wing guys. I'm also talking to, to the uh, strike group commander staff and, and understanding what is happening at the bigger picture. And sometimes I think that is just as rewarding to, to be able to see it all. I mean, I've talked to some people before that within the air wing who didn't really understand why we were doing something like, why, why are we having to do all these surface search and control missions? But when I'm sitting there you know, working with the other side, then I know why we're doing that and, and what it's bringing to the overall situation. I'm really glad you said that, actually, because we have said on this show before that, you know, so many young people, when they think about when they're 17 or 18, that they want to be in the Navy and be an aviator. Of course, they all think Tom Cruise. So they mm -hmm. all want to be fighter pilots. And not everybody gets it. And I think for the most part, and it sounds like you certainly did, you still make the most of it because why sit and wallow in something and be miserable? You're going to find a way to find the good in it or the joy in it. And if not, well, then maybe you 
leave earlier than others, but you've certainly stuck around. How many years now have you been, have you done? About 22 years wow, now. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, you know, you, you either stick around and you find a way to enjoy it and, and make it interesting to you, or, or you move on. And it seems like most people come to terms with that early on. And it sounds like you did too. So that that's awesome. I'm yeah, glad you absolutely. said that. Thanks. All right. So our two final questions here are, what do the future hold for you? Well, uh, I think I mentioned earlier on that uh, I'm in program management now over at uh, Spay War, and I think that's a pretty interesting field. It's it's neat getting to lead a team of people doing software development. The program that I'm on is a joint software program for uh, Chem Bio Defense, and uh, it does warning and reporting for uh, chemical, biological, and radiological threats. Uh, uh, something very different from anything that I've done up to this point, but the basic leadership stuff is all the same. It's, it's the common sense application of being able to prioritize and see what you're dealing with, where your potential threats are. And I'm not talking about threats of somebody launching chemical agent. I mean, although obviously that's what the software is for, right. but I'm talking about threats like you have a high risk area of development and you're trying to weigh which thing is more important. Where do I need to focus my resources? What do I need to do to make sure that I get to the next fielding decision? That's all pretty interesting stuff to me. It, it feels yeah. a little bit like running a business. Oh, cool. And uh, so that's that's pretty neat. Uh, it would be interesting for me to eventually get back more into the naval aviation side of acquisitions and program management. But for right now, this has been a really uh, interesting opportunity cool. for me. All right. So you're going to keep riding the wave a while? You're not looking to uh, step out anytime soon? Well, I... Whether I'm out of the Navy or not, I okay. think that this is a field where I would be going gotcha. in the future, whether it's working as a, a government civilian later on or working in private industry, maybe defense-related, maybe not even defense-related, okay. but it's just a fun area. Well, plus you're here on Coronado, like the ILOs, so That's right. uh, we're not in a bad there, spot. And... There are worse places to be. <laughs> you know, when I was in recruiting, I would joke with people sometimes that the Air Force may have nicer buildings, but the Navy's got nicer real estate. There you go. <laughs> well, I think both groups could argue some of that. Lamar certainly... Uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe, but you know, you did Point Magoo and here yeah. you are in Coronado. So yeah, you're not doing too poorly. Excellent. All right, Niles. Well, the last question we always ask our guests is how did someone come up with a call sign Niles for you? Well, so uh, when I showed up at my first squadron, uh, we were down in Puerto Rico doing a counter drug debt uh, where we're out, you know, monitoring the Caribbean, looking for suspected drug runners and stuff. All right. And I show up there. The squadron's already there. And that first night, we're sitting around in the courtyard of the BOQ area. And uh, the intel officer looks over at me. And like within five minutes of meeting me, he says, do you watch Frasier? And like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, you look a lot like Niles Crane and that just stuck. Wow. And I have to admit, sometimes I've been flipping through channels on TV and I see an old rerun of Frasier and I'm like, Oh, Holy cow. That is me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll put a picture of you on the episode on our website so people can make their own decision on that. But yeah, it seems to suit you. That's how I've known you since the mid 90s. So yeah, my hairline well. receded a little faster than his, though. So <laughs> in my uh, mid 20s, it was a little bit different picture. <laughs> okay. In that story, you used the acronym BOQ. I don't think we've used that acronym here on this show before. So that's Bachelor Officer Quarter. So kind of the Navy's hotel where you stayed while you were on that detachment. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Niles. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I want to thank you for talking air-to-air -air communications and for your 22 years of service. Veterans Day just went by. You're not, I guess, technically a veteran yet since you're still doing it. But thank you for your 22 years of service on behalf of the listener and for your willingness to continue to serve. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Awesome. All right. Let's get out of here. Okay. All right. Once again, big thanks to Niles. Alan Shafino for Talking Air Intercept Communications. Sunshine, I don't know about you. I was concerned a little that that might be a less exciting type of interview because of the subject, but I thought Niles did a really good job making it really interesting. He did, and the, the way he uh, helped develop the picture. Right. For a, pardon the pun, if you will. <laughs> but going from the broadcast to the tactical control did a fantastic right. job of explaining that at a very uh, layman's level. Sure. And like Niles and I mentioned, you know, this is one very limited example of an air-to-air -air intercept. Certainly, add more good guys, add more bad guys, add more complicated anything to this, and we could have talked for hours. But, you know, we say that on just about every episode. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, we did have a handful of new terms that we will, as always, list on our 
website on the glossary tab. So look for those if you're interested. And other than that, just thanks again to Niles. And we are trying, Sunshine, I don't have another episode lined up yet, but I'm hopeful to find a fellow who can talk about air-to-air missions because that actually would segue in nicely with this whole air-to-air communications thing. Yeah, absolutely. And if not, then maybe you and I can just uh, get together and put something together because as we know, Thanksgiving is coming up, so schedules are going to be getting more difficult here. And, and what's going on with you with your new work? Are you doing more traveling? Well, uh, I am going to travel to China Lake to visit with some of the testers with whom I worked when I was back in uniform. But if you don't mind going back to the, hey, we need another topic for uh-huh. a subject, if you will. So we've gotten some feedback. Those, uh, those technical training questions or technical uh, trivia questions, excuse me, perhaps we should... Uh, bloom that idea into, hey, maybe we'll do an episode on, hey, why exactly are the hornet tails canted? You know, we could talk about flight control logic. So we can get a little more technical. So we'll see how what the audience thinks, but uh, the viewers think, but perhaps every now and then we could smatter in a, a more technical, if you will, interview and then uh, jump back into our normal tactical interview. I think that would be good, you know, using a snow skiing analogy, maybe a black diamond episode on some of those deeper subjects that you are familiar with more so than I am, but maybe you can take more of the lead on that episode and we can talk, yeah, to your point, maybe some of the, what, uh, features you see that are on fifth generation fighters, like, like you just said, a lot of them do have the canted vertical stabilizers or blended wings or, I mean, sure, gosh, there's hundreds of subjects and... Maybe if we told people ahead of time, we could have a couple questions ready to go and we could put it on that subject and discuss it from start to finish. Yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't we use our Facebook page as a ah. kind of a vehicle to interact and get some ideas of questions? Because not only talking about the candid tales, which we touched on a little bit on a, a Twitter feed, actually, oh, okay. but we could also talk about why some of the speed brakes in the World War II fighters had a bunch of holes in them. Ooh. I mean, it's a speed break. Why would you have a hole in it? We could talk about transonic effects. Some of the guys would actually go into dives in World War II, they'd get transonic because of compressibility. They couldn't recover, so they couldn't actually pull and recover from the dive, and they, right. would, they would follow the bomb into the target. So well, that was a, all that stuff. Yeah, that was a real problem with the P-38 Lightning, as I've exactly. read in some exactly. various books. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, then, I think we can wrap it up for today. Any parting shots? No, sir. Just congrats again on the qual, and uh, Turkey Day's coming up, so... Uh, Get ready to watch some football and get into your uh, your comatose uh, state, I guess, after a bunch of... Is it L-tryptophan? Is that what that's thing? Like uh, chemical and turkey? I don't think it has the L. I think it's just tip oh, of trip. Tri- but I thought they decided that was just not really oh, it's true. Just, like it's if just you eat full too much of and... anything, you get tired. <laughs> yeah, Fair But enough. it's worth trying. So to those of you who are celebrating Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. To everybody else, enjoy the rest of your November. Before we go, though, let me thank our new Patreon division lead, Mark Pasco, And we have a new Patreon strike leader, Mick Gallagher. Thank you for your support. And finally, let me remind the listeners that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So, Sunshine, we'll see you back here in about 10 days. Sounds like a plan, Jello. What should we do now? Let's get out of here. Boom. See ya. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and to help support the show, visit our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. That was cool.